Good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So today we are moving away from graphical user interfaces and we are moving into the area of scripting languages, which is what we will be. Oops, so excited to show you what's going on. I had it, I lost it. So for the next three days, we are talking about uh, Python. And uh, I'm going to hit the important features of Python. I have notes. Before you take the quizzes for the next three days, make sure you read my notes, okay? So I have my notes for each day, and then I point you to the Python tutorial, which is prepared the, uh, I'm gonna to have to, I see, upgrade that to the latest. I didn't see that before, okay. So I will make the Python tutorial point to the updated one. But each day, my notes are first, Again, day two, my notes, my notes, and then the Python tutorial. So before you take the quizzes, look at my notes, uh, because as I say, I'm not always going to get through every blow by blow detail in my notes. I'm just going to hit on the high points. Uh, let's see. So. We are using Python 3.0 in this course. Uh, I have given you instructions for how uh, you can access Python 3.0 on the Hydra machine. So if you go to the homework and it's homework seven, this command right here will enable the Python version three that we have on the Hydra machines. If you just type in Python on the Hydra machines, you will get version 2.7. And version three is not backwards compatible with version two. So there's certain subtle differences like in printing that uh, will not, that work in Python two, but do not work in Python three. Before you submit homework seven, make sure it runs on the Hydra machines on version 3.3. Uh, my Mac had version 2.7. I had to download uh, from the Python site the uh, version 3.3. And I read that Mac OS was still shipping version 2.7 uh, either until recently or is still doing so. Um, so you just got to make sure that you have the right version of Python. Okay, before we start with Python, I just wanted to give anyone who has a question about homework six an opportunity to ask questions because there's been certainly, I know some questions with the gauge view and some geometry related questions. So any questions about homework six? Nope, okay. Um, I am holding office hours today from three to four. It's bumped back by 15 minutes, so I have a chance to get home. So uh, feel free also to come to office hours uh, with any questions you might have. Okay, so moving into scripting languages, they have a, so first of all, those of you who are looking at um, from home. Are you seeing uh, a big screen with introduction to scripting languages, Brad Vanderzanden, or are you seeing a bunch of my notes? We're seeing the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. What? Huh. Oh, I know what this was. So this was right after Tron was. Uh, um, released the movie Tron. There was a character in the movie Tron called Castor, and um, he's played by Michael Sheen, who's a 
favorite actor of mine. I think he has very good um, comic delivery. And in Tron, he uh, um, at one point comes down, it's in a discotheque that he's running. And he uh, says, he can say, says it so much better than me, but he in kind of a, a devilish tune says, change the scheme, alter the mood, electrify the boys and girls if you would be so kind. And um, there was a band, I think it's Daft Punk, that I believe recently broke up that was uh, playing at this particular one. So I like that because I felt like that's kind of what scripting languages are. Change the scheme, alter the mood, electrify things. I find uh, scripting languages to be so much fun, uh, much more fun than compiled languages. So for me, they do, they electrify things. So scripting languages, it changes the paradigm. The paradigm that you've been working with is an emphasis on programmer, um, I'm sorry, an emphasis on machine efficiency. And if it takes you a long time to write a program in order to get it to run more efficiently, say in uh, 14 seconds on that problem two I gave you with pet detective rather than 20 minutes, then it's worth the effort. And compiled languages like Java, C, C++, they all have an emphasis on machine efficiency. Scripting languages says, no, the emphasis, our emphasis is on programmer efficiency. We want you to be able to quickly write a program and that may sacrifice machine efficiency. So you might write a program that takes one minute to run. And if you had really concentrated on efficiency with a compiled language, maybe you could get it to run in one second. But the idea with scripting languages is many of the programs you're writing are one-offs. And let's say that uh, with scripting, it takes the programmer five minutes to write. plus one minute to execute. And let's say that with a compiled language, it takes 30 minutes to write and one second to execute. Well, here the total time to get a result is six minutes. So time to result. With scripting is six minutes, and with the compiled language is 30 minutes. So if this is a one-time program, the scripting language wins because you got your result in 24 minutes less time. Now, if instead this is a program widely distributed and it's going to be run millions of times, then clearly investing 30 minutes to get the program to run in one second rather than one minute is worth the effort because it's going to be run millions of times. But if instead this is only going to be run once, that 30 minutes is a waste of effort. Or let's say that instead of taking one minute to execute, it ends up taking three seconds to execute. Again, you might say, okay, if I'm Distributing it and it's going to execute millions of times, maybe the 30 minute investment is worth it. But let's say I'm only going to execute it a dozen or so times, then probably again, it's better to just go with scripting. So that's the idea with scripting is that we're going to emphasize programmer efficiency, we're going to sacrifice machine efficiency. And here's how we're going to get it. So scripting languages, first of all, are all about economy of expression, trying to be able to specify things with the least amount of syntax and verbiage. So many scripting languages don't require variable declarations. Uh, you don't have to declare a type, nor do you even have to declare them before you use them. You just start using them. So, for example, Python, the language we're using in this class, 
has a command line interpreter. And I can just say a equals 10. Okay, and its value is 10. Now I can change it to a equals Brad and it's a string variable. So not only do I not have to declare a type, but I can, depending at runtime, I can change the type of value that a variable is storing. So that is what is called flexible dynamic typing, that the current type of a variable depends on the value it currently stores. And that type can change. You can assign uh, different values with different types to the same value variable over its lifetime. Okay. Then the next thing is easy access to system facilities. So for example, I might like to be able to list the contents of a file. And unfortunately, I must admit in Python, I don't use Python for system uh, OS uh, facilities like listing uh, the files in a directory or uh, um, CDing to a new directory, but scripting languages give a OS system independent way to access these commands. So in uh, Unix and Mac OS, the way I list the contents of a uh, file, I'm sorry, the contents of a directory is with LS. But in Microsoft Windows, it's DIR, D-I-R. In a scripting language, they provide their own uh, command. I think in Python, I could be wrong, it's DIR. And that will work on any operating system on which the scripting language works. So it provides a operating system independent way of accessing the OS facilities. The next big thing with scripting languages is that they're all about string manipulation. So they provide sophisticated uh, ways to do pattern matching uh, in strings. And it's using something called regular expressions. Okay. So regular expressions, which we won't spend a lot of time on in this course because we don't have uh, time for it. But for example, um, you might have want to specify a uh, pattern for a date. You want it to be basically in the form month, month, uh, day, day, year, 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 you want it to be optional to, for the month and the day to have either one or two digits. So you could do something uh, like say backslash D, which stands for a digit from one to nine, backslash, oops, backslash D question mark, which means zero or one occurrences. So that's not necessary. Then the dash, then backslash D, uh, backslash D, question mark, then backslash D four. And that's a pattern for specifying this date. It's saying it requires one digit with an optional second digit, then a dash, then a digit with an optional digit, then a dash and um, a dig uh, four digit. Now you'll notice that you could, a digit it turns out is defined as the numbers zero to nine. So you might end up with a leading zero. So you might have to specify here that the digit um, can only go from one to nine. So there's ways to do that too. You could say one to nine. And then the second digit, in fact, can be a zero. So you could still go with the question mark. Same thing, one to nine. Then an optional digit. Then let's say we wanted to force the year to be 2000 or the first um, 
Yeah, for it to be two, uh, 20 something. So we could actually do this. Now we're forcing the first digit of both the month and the day to start with a non zero. And we're forcing the year to start with 2000. So this is what are called regular expressions. And it is, as I said, a very powerful pattern matching facility for strings. For example, this allows you to type check strings that are entered by a user uh, to make sure that they conform to an expected format. Um, also, uh, if you're looking, you have some text like a file and you're looking for all dates, you could specify these patterns to look for them. So scripting languages are all about um, text manipulation, not something that is as frequent or in compiled languages, a lot more of the emphasis is on numeric computation. In scripting languages, the, um, uh, the innovation and the concentration is on string manipulation. Then built-in high-level data types. So the two big built-in uh, types in scripting languages are lists, and hash tables, which you'll also often hear them called associative arrays um, or dictionaries is another word you'll hear used for hash tables. But whether the term is dictionary or associative array, they're hash tables. So those are built in data types. So in Python, a list is anything in square brackets. So this is a list of three um, numbers and I can easily append to it. Okay, so there are um, methods. So these are objects and then they have methods that allow you to manipulate the list. Okay, same thing with hash tables except now they are in brackets like this. And uh, Brad, of course, I'm going to forget. I think it's this. Nope. Uh, what is the syntax for a dictionary? Someone who's a Python person, so I don't have to look it up. What's the right syntax? It's a colon. Colon. Okay, thank you. There we go. So now if I say a Brad using um, array, this is why they're called associative arrays. Whoops. Yeah, there we, uh, there we go. So I'm using, it looks like an array, except now it's the key and it returns three. So dictionaries built in, anything in um, braces like that creates a dictionary or hash table object with uh, key value pairs. Um, and the colon separating them. And again, you use commas to separate your key value pairs. Um, and then they just give nice features with the list. So with this A, whoops, I re, so we'll make it three, six, nine, four, eight. I can do things like negative subscripts. So that gets me the last element. So rather than needing to know the length of A to get the last value, I can just use negative subscripts, which is very handy. I can create slices. So here is a slice starting at two and going up to index four, but not inclusive. So it starts at index two, goes up to four, but is not inclusive of that. And that returns what is called a slice, which is very nice. And I could change that slice. I could say A24 equals now 8, 10, 5, 2. And notice that 3, 6, 9, 4, 8, 2, that the 4 and the 9 have been replaced with 8, 10, 5, and 2. So they provide all of these really nice operations that allow you to easily manipulate lists. Now, what they don't tell you is that lists are implemented as arrays. 
So what I'm doing here is actually really inefficient. Okay, it's not a linked list, which you would think it is since it's called a list. So in fact, in order to insert 8, 10, 5, 2, it did an expensive move of 8 and 2 to uh, the end of the array, what you were taught never to do in CS140. Okay, so, but Python says that's okay. It's inefficient, yes, but we're all about programmer efficiency, not machine efficiency. But you should be aware, lists are not implemented as linked lists in uh, Python, they're implemented as arrays. And then because of all this flexibility, scripting languages are interpreted rather than compiled. Um, Java technically is an interpreted language, but in fact, uses compilation. So Java has an interpreter, the Java runtime environment, and it's interpreting bytecodes, but um, through the use of hotspot compilation, just-in-time compilation, compilation, um, the bytecodes are assembly language, essentially. So Java is considered a compiled language, but not so with uh, languages like Python, JavaScript, PHP. They are interpreted. And they run more slowly because of that. So for example, I can create these variables on the fly. Well, how is that done? It turns out that Python is keeping a symbol table, which is a hash table. And it is simply mapping my variable names into this hash table. Well, that's a lot slower than having fixed offsets, which is what you get in a compiled language. So in a compiled language, when I declare in a, in a um, function, for example, if I have like int swap or int, uh, let's say int add, and maybe int x, int y, and I have int sum, and I say sum equals x plus y, well, I have a stack frame. And that stack frame assigns fixed offsets in that stack frame to each variable. So x might be at offset 0 in that stack frame, y might be at offset 4, and some might be at offset 8. So at runtime, the code that is executing knows exactly where x, y, and sum are in the stack frame. Whereas in Python, what happens is it allocates a hash table with a bunch of entries, maybe from say zero up to 10. And there may be collisions here, depending, I don't know how they implement their hash tables. So maybe x hashes to one and maybe uh, y and sum both hash to 10. So it's looking them up dynamically by doing a hash each time on the variable name. So clearly that's slower than knowing exactly where in the stack frame to find x, y, and sum, okay? So scripting languages are inherently slower than compiled languages, okay? Can easily be 10 times slower at times, but they make, you writing it, you can write it much faster than you could uh, in, um, in a compiled language like C, C++, or the like. Okay, so we have chosen for this course to look at Python. Python is very uh, C-like, which is, I think, one of the reasons why it is so popular. And in fact, you saw it has a nice command line interpreter. So just by typing Python, you can try things out at the command line. Um, you can also create a Python file. It typically has the uh, prefix p dot py. So
that's not it. No. There we go. So typically it is a dot py prefix, and you can load those in. So I can say Python, and the import statement will import it. And you'll notice I did not put a dot py. So just like Java, it automatically does the py. And it actually did execute, could not convert data to an integer. If we look at what was going on, it had a try statement. It tried to open myfile.txt. It read a line into s, and it tried to uh, convert that line to an integer. And it turned out that in, if you look at myfile, It was brat, so it couldn't convert it. So what happened? Oops, is that it threw an exception, which was a value error, and it printed could not convert data to an integer. So um, you can see we'll get to this on the third day. The try catch statements in Python, uh, very similar to. C++, although it uses accept rather than catch to do things. Okay, so with the in import statement, you can load a file. And sometimes, there we go. When it imports it, it, comp it seemingly compiles it. You see this dot PYC, but this is simply a, um, Python bytecodes is has translated the statements down to bytecodes, but it's still interpreting them. Unlike Java, it doesn't do any compilation. So the next time I load foo.py, it will actually import the PYC file. And that will be faster because it doesn't have to convert the source code to bytecodes, but the execution won't be any faster. Just the load time will be faster. Okay, so today what we're looking at in uh, Python is going to be the basic data structures and the control structures and the variables. So, whoops, not, don't want to be printing that. So, ah. You can also invoke Python from the command line. So I could also have just said Python foo.py and it executes it. So that you give the interpreter. Now you do give the complete file name, not just foo, and it will execute it. So that's another way of executing Python programs. Okay, argument passing. So it is like C++ in that argv0 contains the name of the file. So in that case, it would have been foo.py. In order to get at the command line arguments, you must import sys. So you noticed here, import sys. And you get at argv through sys.argv. So even after you've imported it, you still have to prefix the name. So for example, Python import math, and I wanna compute the power two to the third power. Oh, it did work, okay. I thought I had to say math.power, but not so. I can just, well, that's interesting. There is a difference. Huh, that might be the built-in power function. Let's try cosine. There we go. So the thing was, pal was built in. So even after you do the import statement, you still can't get at the um, functions without naming them. And there is a way to, uh, say, bring these values into the namespace, which uh, we'll talk about later, but not right now. 
Okay, uh, comments, they start with a, a one-liner, starts with a, a hashtag, multi-liners uh, generally start with three um, quotes and end with three quotes. Um, some built-in operators that you may not be used to, exponentiation. So I didn't have to write pal there. I could have just said two and I would have gotten the result, which is nice. Okay, um, important in Python 3.0, the division is always floating arithmetic. If you want to get integer arithmetic, you do what is called floor division. So floor division also works with your floating point operands. So three, two gets you one, 3.5, two gets you one. So that works with both um, integers and floating point numbers. But if you want integer division, you do floor division. Okay, um, so again, uh, things that are neat, if you're trying to be as terse as possible and make your code as unreadable as possible, underscore holds the last computed result. So A equals three plus five. Huh, that's not the last computed result. But that is interesting. I guess assigning three plus five to a is not considered a previously computed result. So okay. it's technically the last output. Pardon? It's technically the last output. Which ah, is technically the last output. Okay, so if I say print three, well, but is, that's not a computed result. So the last computed result that led to output. Thank you. Okay. Uh, strings, uh, single quotes, double quotes, or triple quotes. Uh, triple quotes are normally for spanning multiple lines. Uh, you use a backslash to escape quotes, meaning that if you want to use a backslash, you have to use R as the prefix for it. So if I want a string that includes uh, backslash three, four, I have to do it that way. I can't do this because it thinks something else is afoot. Okay. Um, strings are immutable. So you think when you assign a new string to something that it is um, getting a new string it's not changing the original string, it's changing the pointer. Python uses garbage collection. So uh, the string that was previously pointed to will get garbage collected if nothing else points to it. Plus it's concatenation. Again, it creates a new string. So you can access the individual characters like it's an array. Um, you can use the negative indexing I talked about for strings. Um, you can slice a string. By the way, I didn't show you. So if you omit, if I have um, A equals Brad Vander, A, if I just say it like this, it goes from the beginning. So I get the first six ones from zero to five. If I say six to the end, then I get the last part of it. So I can omit either the first part and I get zero or the last part and I get it to the end. Another useful thing is the split. For splitting, often you read a line and you want to split it. The way you do it is with the split command, it returns an, a list. So for example, A equals three, five, eight, you say split and you'll get this uh, list of three words and you're allowed to provide a delimiter. So for example, I could say, I could have A equals three, whoops.
and whoops. And now A and I'll split it on a comma and I get three, six, nine, twelve. Now the problem is let's say for niceness purposes, I put spaces. You'll notice I unfortunately ended up with spaces because it literally is using the comma as the delimiter. So then I could strip. So I could say, for example, a dot split and the second entry, which will be nine. I will strip it and strip strips the leading and trailing white space. So strip is a nice command for stripping leading and trailing white space. So you're kind of hopefully getting an idea of how flexible um, it is with uh, string manipulation, how it's really trying to make string manipulation easy and how when you get lines of input, there may be extraneous white space at the end of the line or the beginning of the line, how you can strip it away using the strip command. Um, one thing that's not quite as nice is it doesn't do automatic conversions. It's a little strict with its typing. So if I try to say A equals Brad plus three, it doesn't like that because three is not a string. Um, most lang scripting languages would automatically convert three to a string form, but in Python, you actually have to explicitly convert the type. So Python is a little um, more finicky about its type checking than some other scripting languages. Okay, um, we talked about lists. Unlike strings, lists are mutable. And notice they can be nested, which is pretty nice. So you can have lists of lists. Um, just like strings, lists are pointed to by pointers, but you can't get access to the pointers. It's just like Java. So anytime you change the list, it is a shallow copy. So if I say, um, here I have a, I'm sorry, a equals three, six, nine. I said B equals to a, I changed B to um, 11 and a is also changed to 11 because all that happened, it wasn't a deep copy. It was a shallow copy using pointers. So A and B now pointed to the same list. Remember, lists are implemented as arrays. Now, let's get to something that has always been controversial in Python, and that is how programs get written using indentation. So indentation in Python is used in place of braces. The um, the developer of Python did not really hate it braces, felt like they detracted from, I don't know, the beauty of the program and also uh, made it lengthier. Remember, economy of expression is everything. So he decided that indentation would determine blocks and you would put a colon after a condition, so you didn't have to use parentheses. A colon would terminate the condition. So to show a block here, the way you do it is you indent the block and each statement has to be indented by the same number of spaces. If I don't indent by the same number of spaces, Python will get annoyed with me. So um, let's actually first tell you what's going on here. First of all, this may look unusual. Another nice feature of Python, it evaluates the right-hand side expressions first, and then assigns each of the right-hand side expressions to the corresponding variable on the left-hand side. So A is set to zero, B is set to one. The while loop I'm sure you uh, have seen before, print, prints the value. But here you can see, I instead of saying um, A or B equals, or A equals, 
I want to assign B to A and I want to assign A plus B to uh, B. And normally I would have to probably do something like a temporary variable to store an intermediate result. But this is very nice. I can just say, okay, I want B to go to A. I want the current value of A and B to be added together and assigned to B. And it evaluates these right-hand sides first and then assigns them to A and B. Try to do this without this multiple assignment. And I suspect you will find that you need to use an intermediate variable to store uh, the old value of one of those two variables. But what I want to show you here is the importance of indentation. So add.py. So here's the program. I can run it and all is good. It's printing out B. So you can see I've, anyone know what this program really is? It's like the Fibonacci sequence. It's a Fibonacci sequence, yep. So it's a very uh, succinct way of writing the Fibonacci sequence. And, um, but I want to show you, I'm just going to remove one space like that. So, and try to run it. And it doesn't like it. Unindent does not match any outer indentation level. So this has always been controversial. Some people love it. Some people hate it. It is what it is. If you use Python, you're going to use indentation. And you have to be careful about tabs because tabs in different editors um, may or may not be converted to spaces. So you often have to just type out your spaces, which is another pain in the neck. Um, again, uh, your control statements terminate with a colon. And that's, so if I leave off the colon, I'll also get an error message. Invalid syntax. So the colons are important. Okay. Um, the Boolean constants are uppercase true, uppercase false. We can check to see whether it doesn't like lowercase false. So you can see that case is important. The relational operators, they work for both numbers and strings. So not like Java, unlike Java, they do do a deep comparison rather than a shallow comparison. The Boolean operators are short circuit. They are not and. So you can't say three and six. You have to say three and six. So the logical operators, and, or, and not. Again, it's just the person who designs the language gets to choose things. Another nice thing is the way that you can actually write inequalities the way you expect. So you can chain them like this. This doesn't work in a compiled language. So if A is 15, Let's say actually A is 30 in a compiled language. What happens in a compiled language is it will say, is 10 less than or equal to 30? The answer is true. What does true get converted to in a compiled language like C or C++? It would be one, right? One. So then it compares one with 20 and that's true as well. So it will say that 30 is between 10 and 20, which is not what you want. But in Python, it does exactly what you think it should. It only returns true if A is between 10 and 20. Okay, or here, this is only true if A is less than B and B is equal to C. So very nice. If you want, just like, well, for those of ta you taking 465 from me, who are used to SQL and using in and lists, you can avoid using ORs in Python by asking if a variable is in a list of values like this. By the way, you're allowed to have lists with mixed types. 
Oops. Very happy. So you can mix your types in uh, Python as well. Okay, if statements, you have to use LF instead of else if. And it's picky about that. So A equals 10. If A is less than 10, print A else if uh, A equals 10 syntax error, because that's not the way you do it. If A is less than 10, print A, you have to say LF, just stubborn. Okay, so A equals 10, print A plus five, else. Now I can use else, print A plus 20. Okay, and it works. So again, it's persnickety. If you want to do a nested chain of if statements, you have to say L if, not else if. And it just enforces it. And notice the colon terminating each one, and you have to use indentation for each block. Python, unlike most um, scripting languages doesn't have a switch statement. I don't know why, it just doesn't. Also, Python does not have the equivalent of C's counting for loops. So you cannot write, interestingly enough, you cannot say for I equals zero, I less than 10, I plus plus, syntax error. Instead, you have to say I in range, and then you always have to figure out what range returns. So range zero to 10, well, let's try it. I in range zero to 10, print I, and you can see it is not inclusive. So the zero is inclusive, but the range isn't. So that's how you do the equivalent of counting loops. You can say for I in range zero, 10, two, now it will increment in increments of two. So this is what is called a generator function. We'll get to that uh, in a moment. But just know there is no equivalent of C's counting loop. It does have the equivalent of C's while loop. I think it has the equivalent of, I think it has a do, let's see. And I don't think it does, because that would be, yep, does not have the equivalent of a do while. Okay, does have the equivalent of a while. So you can go through, what is nice is you can go through any sequence with a loop. So for x in this list, so it's very easy to iterate through a loop or list, much easier. So notice now how, again, Python is using its built-in um, data structures and making them work nicely with its control structures to make iteration very easy. Okay, now you're thinking, well, wait a minute, sometimes I need to know the index how am I going to get the index? Well, Python gives you a way. So by the way, with range, you can provide an arbitrary beginning and ending point and an increment. So if you want to get both the position index and value, then you use the enumerate command for the sequence and it will give you both the um, integer index and that value. So that's how you can enumerate, uh, get your indices for a list in a for loop. Another nice thing, let's say you want to work with two or more lists 
for sequences simultaneously. So here I want to take the dot product or not dot product. I just want to do vector uh, multiplication. So here's the first list for vector. Here's the second vector. So I zip the two vectors together. And that means that I will get synchronized values. So the first time through, I get 10 for V1 and five for V2. Next time I get 20 for V1 and 10 for V2. Actually, I was taking a dot product. I'm sorry, product equals product plus V1 times V2. So I was doing a dot product. Then you're thinking, how do I reverse something? You do it with the reversed function. So remember with a range, you can, um, I think with a range you can count down. So let's just try that for X in range uh, nine zero by minus one. And it works. Let's try now uh, for X in reversed range zero ten. It also works. So you can do it either way, but the reversed function will reverse a sequence. Okay, if you want to walk through a dictionary, something you frequently want to do then dict.keys returns a sequence that you can an iterable sequence for the keys and iter items returns the key value pair. So here I set up some uh, um, people with their ages and then iter items to iterate through that dictionary with the key value pairs. You can see print K comma V, it prints things out nicely. Um, next time, we're going to talk about how to do nice formatted printing. Right now, print is just printing things out with a space between the variables. One nice thing about loops is this else statement. So break and continue work just like other ones. What's nice about Python is you can put an else statement at the end of the loop. And that else statement executes only if the loop executes to completion. If a break statement occurs, the else statement is not executed. But if the uh, break statement does not execute and the loop terminates, the else condition is executed, which is really nice. Think how often you do searches and you have to set a Boolean to indicate that the search succeeded when you break out or you check your index variable to see whether the index variable reached the end of the list. Python says, hey, that's a little complicated. Uh, here's an example where I'm uh, printing out prime numbers in the range two to 10. So what I do is uh, when I have my N, I go through um, X in the range up to N. I know this is inefficient, so be it. I see if N can be evenly divided by X. And if it can, then I print that N is equal to X times that um, quotient. And I break out to the next um, iteration, which will be increment N by one. But if this doesn't work, and I reach the end of the loop, and none of the divisor, none of the divisors has evenly divided the dividend, then this else executes, and we print n is a prime number because it meant we did not find a factor. So this else is a very handy thing on a loop. And in today's quiz, I quiz you on that. I actually have a question. And the most convenient way, best way to write it is using an else statement like this. Okay, functions. Functions start with def, function name, comma separated list of arguments, and optional return value with the return statement. So just very C-like. Um, things are uh, built-in types passed by value, 
objects passed by reference. So for example, um, if I have a list, B equals 1020, I have a definition of append to list and x and x dot append 50, kind of a boring function, but I say append to list D. When it comes out, it's 50, and that's because objects are passed by reference. So anything that I change in the function is changed outside of the function. Now values are passed by value. So if I say A equals 10, and I have um, def sum um, x increment, x equals x plus increment, that is not going to change A. So if I say sum A with 15, A is still 10 because it was passed by value. Okay, I have some stuff about documentation strings. Don't worry about them in your um, code. I'm not asking you to uh, document your functions using these documentation strings, but um, they have a specific form that allows Python to easily extract this information to create documentation for the function. Um, variables local by default. If you want to use a global variable, then you need to declare it as global if you want to um, access a global variable. So if you don't do that, then, so let's say I have x equals 30, def sum um, x equals x plus one. In C++, this would increment x to be 31. In this case, local variable x referenced before assignment. So I never assigned a value to it. So that's different than C or C++. Okay, I talk about this documentation string, feel free to read it. Um, it's just a specific um, sequence of how you do things so that Python can pull documentation out of it. Okay, um, you are allowed to have variable length argument list, but we won't discuss it in this class. You are allowed to have Lambda functions, but they're pretty lame. Um, Lambda functions, for those of you who don't know, were adopted from functional languages. They are anonymous functions without a name. So here, what is happening is we are creating a function, a dynamic function from this string formula. So think of a spreadsheet where you enter something like A plus B in the spreadsheet, and you could implement it in Python by saying, okay, I'm returning a function that will evaluate this formula. Okay, here's one that creates an incrementer. So what happens is I'm returning a anonymous function. It takes one parameter X and it's adding whatever um, X is to this value N. So N is hard coded in this function. As you can see, I assign the return result, which is a function to F. And when I call F of one, it gets returns 43 because I created a function that was effectively Lambda X, X plus 42. So this is something you cannot do in C or C++. You're creating a dynamic function. This function did not exist 
at compile time. You are creating a dynamic function at runtime. Okay, um, but they're very weak. You, a lambda expression can only be a single expression that computes a value. You can't use control structures. So for example, I can't say um, that this is how I would write a lambda function uh, that returns x if x is less than y and y otherwise. So I say x if x less than y else y. I can't say, um, can't write That won't work, syntax error. But I can say um, does work. So he creates a function at that address. Okay, and that brings us, I think, to our last thing. So, yes. So, range is a generator function. It actually generates things on command. Watch that. When I say range 0, 10, it doesn't return a list 0, 9. It, what it returns is an iterable generator function that's going to generate values on demand. And you often hear the word generator function. That's what's happening. Usually you use generator functions with things that could yield an infinite sequence, but they could be a bounded sequence too. And you use the yield statement to return a value. So for example, here is a Fibonacci function. The first two values in the sequence are one. So a generator function is returning a sequence and you can iterate over that sequence. So the first two values that are going to be in the sequence are one and one. Then I set my current and previous to be one and one and I'm going to execute an infinite loop. So obviously if I tried to execute this function without the generator function, it would get into an infinite recursion. But the way I've written it, this will not get into an infinite recursion. It will yield one value at a time. So I set current and previous to be the appropriate values for the Fibonacci numbers, and then I yield current. It's like a print statement, except that it is returning the current value, and it stops execution at that point. So execution ends at that point. So now I can treat that function as though it is a sequence. So I say for i in fib, if i is greater than 100, I break. So that prevents me from being in an infinite loop. And then otherwise I print i. And so the yield statements give me one and one to begin with. Then I get a two, then I get a three, so on and so forth. Okay, so very nice. Um, again, yield bit like print, and it temporarily stops the function. Okay, so let me actually put this into a get rid of those dots. So now I can say fib dot next. Oops, I think I. How did I do it? How did I see? Ah. Uh. 
So I didn't see how you did it, but if the definition of fib is in a file dot, yeah, you got to do fib dot yeah. fib. Thank you. Do a equals fib dot fib. Oh. It's killing me. Uh, I just suck. There we go. So the next, what? Okay. Try this. What do you mean that's wrong? Ah. Seems odd. I don't know. What am I doing? Okay, I'm really baffled. Uh, just a second. Let me find what I'm doing. If I'm just why the next statement? Seriously? Seriously. Okay. So it's not. So the next had to go that way. So I'm going to have to update my notes. So next just returns the next value that it ex causes fib to execute up to the next yield statement. So my way of doing it was wrong. That must have changed. Wonder if it changed between two point X and three point X. Okay. Anyhow, you got to be, you can't use yield statements in a recursive function. So uh, generator functions don't work the way you would expect with recursive functions. So here's factorial N. If N equals one, yield one, else yield N times fact N minus one. And you think, ah, this should work because fact n minus one should return a number, but it doesn't. It wants to return a sequence. Remember, I'm sorry, and should be factorial, not fact. So I should have actually written factorial. But the problem is that since it's a generator function, it's not returning a value, it's returning itself a generator function. So you can't write um, recursive functions uh, easily. A very simple way to do it would be to nest a function, which you can do in Python. So it's a local function nested. And I generate my sequence of n factorial values. So I actually generate a list. Um, starting at one where I return one. And then after that, whoops, I append to result n times result and take the minus one because that's the, the last value in result is n minus one factorial. And at the end I return results. So I set results equal to fact n, which gives me a list, it will give me a list that is Like if n is um, five, it will give me a list that is one, 
two, six, 24, 120. And then I would just iterate through the results and yield it one at a time. Not elegant, but hey, it works. So um, generator functions, they are used. That's what the range function is. Again, there's a quiz uh, about the generator functions. Very handy for being able to, as I say, generate things like infinite sequences and but not running into an infinite loop problem. You just can yield one result at a time and then get it to pause. So any questions about what we've discussed today? Okay, if not, then I'll let you all go and I will see you on Thursday when we will get into how you do IO in Python and uh, some of the other, well, we'll get into dictionaries and sets. Uh, and I think that may be the extent of what we talk about on Thursday. Make sure about that. I will on Thursday have you go through a homework problem. So that is a bonus. I'll actually probably have you work on one or two of the homework problems and we may actually go through the solutions. So another incentive for you to show up on Thursday. Okay. <laughs>